Why do bad things happen to good people? Maybe a better question is, why do bad things happen to Christians? And when bad things happen, how should Christians respond? Well, don't get your hopes up. I'm not going to be able to answer all of these questions fully in the next 39 minutes. But I do think our text for today gives us some insight on why bad things happen. And also, more importantly, how Christians should respond when they do happen. As Pastor Quinn said, my name is Joshua. If this is your first time here, thanks so much for being here. Uh, pastor Randy, our senior pastor, is away for a few weeks. He's taken some time off, and I encourage you to be praying for him and Donnell, his wife, uh, that they would uh, get rest and refreshed and come back uh, with uh, clarity uh, for the, the, the fall season of our church. Pastor Barry, our executive pastor, will be preaching next week. And then on the 23rd, Pastor Quinn is scheduled to speak again. So I hope that you'll uh, make plans to join us as we continue in this series, Counting It All Joy. We're going to look through the book of Philippians together. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 12. Paul says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me now, I want you to pay attention to this phrase, what has happened, because we're going to see it a couple of times, a couple of more times uh, in this passage. Um, but I want to sort of remind you of the context. Pastor Randy did a great job of setting this up and helping us to understand the book of Philippians. But maybe you weren't here. Maybe you need a refresher. Paul's writing to the church at Philippi. This is a church that he started. And we read about it in Acts chapter 16. And there's a woman there named Lydia, and Paul... Uh, she's a very wealthy businesswoman, and Paul helps to convert her. She, she becomes a follower of Jesus and her and her household. And then there's a fortune teller that's following Paul around, pestering him, and he commands the demon to come out of the fortune teller, and she's saved. Well, then the fortune teller's owners, they get mad, and they throw Paul in prison. And that's when we have the famous story of Paul and Silas in prison, and they're singing at midnight, they're singing hymns, and they're bound with chains, and the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon the jail, and all their chains are loosed, and the doors are open, but instead of running away, they tell the jailer about the gospel and about Christ, and the jailer and his family are baptized, and the church is started. That's how the church of Philippi began, with those three converts and their families. And Paul is now writing to the church at Philippi, um, uh, some time later, and now he's in prison again. This time he's in prison, most likely in Rome. Most scholars believe Rome, maybe in Ephesus, but probably Rome, and we'll see why in just a minute. But he's in prison, and he's under house arrest, but he's in this prison facility, so to speak, and, uh, and he's attached to this Roman guard, and he's been there for about two years. And now he's writing to the church at Philippi, and he's telling the Philippians, hey, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. This is an incredible statement to me. Notice the, the joy in this statement from Paul. He's saying, what has happened to me? You know what? All that stuff that I've gone through, all the stuff that I've been through, it's actually okay because the gospel has been advanced. Now, if, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you know that he spent the majority of his adult life in some sort of suffering or pain or punishment or prison, right? Uh, he was shipwrecked. He was cold. He was homeless. He was hungry. He was beaten. He was stoned. He was left for dead. He was imprisoned multiple times. And he's saying, what has happened to me? Actually, it's, it's been okay because it's been served to advance the gospel. Now, I'm not at all trying to minimize or even compare how the inconveniences that we get here in America as Christians compare to Paul's suffering. All right, there's, there's not really a comparison. Or the suffering that our brothers and sisters across the world are experiencing because of their faith in Jesus in Iran and Iraq and North Korea and Russia and other places. This is actually real suffering. We on, in America, as of yet... The most we get are maybe, maybe made fun of or humiliated in some way, inconvenienced most of the time. So I'm not trying to compare the two here. But we also, even here in America, we experience difficult things. Some of you right now are going through difficult things that, and you're wondering, why is this happening to me? Some of you have experienced loss. Some of you have had 
been laid off from your job recently and you're struggling to pay your mortgage, or your child, you're so worried about your child because they're, they're far from the Lord and they're not following the ways of the Lord, the Lord anymore, or you're concerned because you've, you just, you're, someone in your family just has a, a diagnosis of cancer and you don't know why this is happening or what you're going to do next. Some of you have lost loved ones. And these are real, real uh, significant issues that we deal with. My question for us today is, how can we use what is happening, happened to us, or maybe what is happening to us, how can we use it to advance the gospel? Like if you were to write a letter to Bethany Church, and you were to say, hey, Bethany, I want you to know, what has happened to me, it's actually okay. Because it's been used to advance the gospel. Two things that I think have to happen in order for us to be able to say this, that, that what, is, what we're experiencing or what we have experienced is going to be used to further the gospel. One, we need to live grace-filled lives. We live grace-filled lives in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the difficulty. Are you filled with grace or filled with grump when bad things happen? Like, are, do you complain? Something negative happens to you, and the first thing you do is take to social media and complain because this and this happened. Or are you, a, are you a person who's filled with grace, and you say, you know what, I don't know exactly why this has happened, but I'm going to extend grace in this circumstance. You know, other people are actually watching you. They're watching to see how you respond when trials come your way. The second thing is that We've got to share the reason for the joy in you. So you live a grace-filled life, and then others, they notice that grace in your lives in the midst of the trial, and as a result, then you share the reason, you share Jesus, the reason for the joy that lives in you. For Paul, it worked out like this. And verse 13, as a result, it has become clear through the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. So he's, this is why I believe it was in, he was in Rome because of the palace guard, the whole palace guard. Everyone in the palace knew why he was in chains. He was in chains for preaching the gospel. And it's ironic that while he's in chains for preaching the gospel, he continues to preach the gospel. As a result, the whole palace guard and everyone else knows that, that he's in chains for Christ. I wonder... The people that you work with, do they even know that you are a Christian? Those who know, know what you're experiencing, have you expressed, you know what? I'm experiencing this, but actually I have joy because of what Jesus has done for me. Paul goes on, he says, And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Did you know? That God uses your response to trials to encourage other believers and to embolden them to share their faith. Did you know that? So how you respond to what things happen can be, uh, is determined about whether or not the gospel is advanced. If you live a grace-filled life and if you share the hope, the reason that is in you. Verse 15. Paul says, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, not sincerely, but, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. Now, what is Paul talking about here? Paul is a very influential person. A very strong leader. He's very well known in the, uh, in the churches all across the area. He's written uh, a couple of books by now. And those books are the, that we know in the Bible, those letters, they've been circulated among the churches. And Paul's a pretty famous guy. It would sort of be like if Billy Graham was in prison and then somebody else comes and tries to take Billy Graham's place. And that's what was happening to Paul. Other people were trying to preach Christ but there were two people. Some were doing it out of goodwill because they loved Paul and they loved the gospel. And some were preaching Christ out of selfish ambition. They were trying to gain their own following by preaching Christ 
um, so that they could get a crowd. They could get influence. They could get authority. They could get popularity. The next, the next verse is actually, it's incredible. Paul is so emotionally healthy because <laughs> he says, what does it matter? If this were me, I'm saying, what does it matter? Like, I've spent all this time preaching the gospel and all these people are following me and now these people are trying to take my flock, trying to take my authority. I'm not saying what does it matter, but Paul says, what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. I grew up uh, in a great home. Uh, had a great childhood. My dad is a, has bas- basically been a pastor my entire life. Um, my mom pointed us to Jesus, and they, uh, in a couple of years, they'll celebrate, Lord willing, their 50th wedding anniversary. They've been together for that long. I had great teachers in school. I had great Sunday school teachers and kids' church leaders. Really, just an incredible childhood. But one of the things that I sort of picked up, and nobody told me this specifically, it was just through some interactions that I had over time. But as I was growing up, I picked up on this idea that if other churches did things differently than we did, then they were somehow in the wrong, or even worse, they were sinful. Like, and maybe you've, maybe you've never even thought of this. Maybe this has not been a thing for you. But I wonder, what would it be like well, actually, I realized as I have matured and, and study God's word and become friends with believers from other churches and even other denominations, like, really, what does it matter if they do things a little bit differently? Ultimately, the question is, is Christ preached? That's, that's what the question is. So what does it look like for us as Bethany Like, when you see another church with more cars in the parking lot than our church, are you envious? Do you complain or make excuses? Well, did you hear that they started doing this? Or I heard that they are... Is that really the important thing? Or should we say, you know what? They do things a little bit differently, and we don't agree on everything, but ultimately, we rejoice, Paul says, Because of this, I rejoice. Why? Because Christ is preached. Hear me, okay? I only get to preach one time a year, so I just got to get it all out. (laughs) All right? It's okay. It's it's okay. And I I don't want anybody to leave Bethany. But it's, it's okay if somebody leaves our church and goes to Life Church. It's okay. Like, we want everybody to grow and be discipled here, and we want more people to come and experience Jesus. But other churches in our community that are also preaching Christ, like, let's rejoice with them that they're preaching Christ and that souls are being saved and people are being forgiven of their sins and being baptized into the family. I heard it, I heard it described this way. Okay, so there are some things that are closed fist doctrinal issues. Some things we hold with a closed fist, like we hold on to these things very tightly. We are not letting them go. The inerrancy of God's word, that's one thing that we hold on tightly. We're not letting that go. It is perfect without error. It was written by God through men, and we can trust every word in the word of God, that we hold that tightly. We hold tightly to the truth that God is three persons in one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He created the world. God created the world through Jesus, and he created it for his glory and for our good so that we could enjoy him forever. But we, man, sinned and separated us from God. So God made a plan to send his son, Jesus, who lived a perfect life but died a sinner's death on the cross in our place And three days later, he rose from the dead victoriously. And those who place their faith in Jesus have forgiveness of their sins, the righteousness of Christ on their behalf, and hope of eternal life. These are the things we hold with a closed fist. Amen? Amen. There are other things that we hold with an open hand. Some things that the Bible's not entirely clear about, or maybe you could interpret it a little bit differently. We hold these things with an open hand. Okay, for example, I believe 
that God created the world in six literal 24-hour days. All right, I hold that with an open hand, though, because that, what I'm saying, doesn't affect my salvation or my relationship with God. If another Christian believes that it took longer than 24, they don't believe it was 24 literal, uh, literal days, that's okay. That doesn't mean I have to lose fellowship with them because they believe that or I believe something differently. Am I, are, you, are you with me? So there are some things that are closed fist. There are some things that are open-handed, but it doesn't mean we lose fellowship. Paul, the reason that he was able to say to the people who were trying to steal his authority and steal his position, he was able to say, as long as Christ is preached, I rejoice. The reason he was able to do that is because Paul's identity was not in his following. It was in the one whom he followed. So he says, what does it matter? What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. He goes on, yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit, here's the second time we see this phrase, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Notice that in order for us to be delivered, through the difficult things that we experience, there's two things that have to happen. Through the prayers of God's people. You need people praying for you in order to experience the full provision of God's deliverance. You need people praying for you. It's been a joy for me over the last three plus years. Right after COVID started, we started a Zoom prayer group. And for the last three years, pretty much... Nearly every Tuesday, we meet together on Zoom and we pray, and it's a handful of us, and it has been a joy and a delight to pray with these men and women every Tuesday. We bear one another's burdens. We share what we're struggling with. We share our fears. We share where we need prayer. We pray for you, our church. We pray for the community around us. We pray for our nation. We pray for our world. And I'm convinced we've seen so many answered prayers because we've come together and we've seen deliverance in some ways because of the prayers of God's people. You need people praying for you. And one way you can do that is to get involved in a Bethany group. Bethany groups meet every Sunday at 1015. And if you're not a part of Bethany group, now's a great time to start. Start the second half of this year off the right way and join a Bethany group. And if you're a part of a Bethany group, let me just encourage you, like be honest with your group about what you're struggling with, about your concerns, about your fears. Like if all you talk about is your vacation plans and all the good things, how's, how are things going? Oh, I'm doing great. If that's your response in your Bethany group, you are missing out on a big part of what a Bethany group is a, is a part of because they want to pray with you. And in order for you, according to God's word, in order for you to experience some deliverance, you need people who are praying for you. The second thing is God's provision of the spirit, Paul says. So your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ. This is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a gift and his presence in our lives is what will help to provide deliverance in the midst of the difficult circumstance, in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the difficult things that happen. But just so a little word of caution for you, this Holy Spirit is actually only for Christians. Like if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, you're not a follower of Jesus, you don't have the Holy Spirit. And therefore, you're striving to try to be delivered through these difficult circumstances is not gonna happen because you don't have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so maybe today is the day for you to say, I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus. I'm going to place my faith in Jesus. And not only do you receive forgiveness of sins and hope of eternal life, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who is there to be with you and to help you in your deliverance. What has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Paul says it like this in Romans chapter 8. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He goes on, I eagerly, he says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted 
in my body, whether by life or death. Now, what is Paul talking about here? Remember, he's in prison, and he's about to go on trial. He's about to go have to defend his faith. And probably, if he's in Rome, which he probably is, he's probably going to go up against Caesar. Like he's, gonna, he's waiting for his court date, so to speak, to go see Caesar and to defend his faith. And he's saying, I expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but I'm going to have the courage that I need to proclaim Christ to anybody that is up against, I'm up against in this trial. But the thing is, he doesn't know what's going to happen. He could, be, he could defend his case and be executed the ver- that very hour, or he could be freed. He doesn't know. And so he says, whether by life or by death, my goal is that Christ will be exalted. And then comes the verse that all of us, probably most of us, have heard before. Verse 21, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To live is Christ means that you live for Christ. Christ. You live to honor Jesus, to worship Jesus, to glorify Jesus, to proclaim Jesus, to defend Jesus. And I wonder today, how would you fill in this blank? I live for, fill in the blank. Like, take an honest evaluation of yourself and ask, like, how, who am I living for? What am I living for? If, if we're honest, some of you would say, I live for money. I live for money and more of it. And I'm doing everything I can to make my life as comfortable as I can. Some of you would say, I live for what others think of me. Like, the opinions of others are what drive every or most of the decisions I make. What they say about me, that's what's most important to me. So therefore, I live for the opinions of others. Or I live for the next job promotion. Or I live for a new car or a bigger house. Some of you, remember it's my only time to preach, okay? There's a lot of grace, a lot of grace. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But some of you, if you were really honest, maybe would say, I live for my kid's future. Some of you might say, I live for my kid's athletic future. Like if the only time, hear me, If the only time that you come to church is when you don't have a sporting event to attend, are you saying to your kids, I live for Christ? Paul says it this way in Philippians chapter 3. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things and consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ. So how do you fill in the blank this morning? I live for, Paul says, if I go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I have struggled with this phrase, what shall I choose? Because different commentators, they they disagree on what he's saying. He goes on and says, I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Some say that he's saying, I prefer to go ahead and die so that I can be with Christ. Some saying that maybe in some way he has a choice uh, of whether or not he lives or dies. Uh, I don't think here he's contemplating suicide, but let's consider the context. He is in prison, and this is not his first time in prison. I'm assuming that he is worn out. He's struggling. He's exhausted. In another passage, we see this same mindset of Paul in 2 Corinthians. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure it so that we despaired even of life itself. So this is not Paul's first time to wrestle with, oh Lord, I just wish you would take me home. And I think this this phrase, choose, I think he's trying to decide, am I going to fight and defend the gospel or am I just going to be silent? Because if I'm silent, almost certainly I'm going to be executed, but that's okay because I'm going to gain Christ. But if I defend the gospel, then I'm going to keep on living and it's better for you uh, if I am there. So that's why he says, I'm torn between the two. 
I desire to be part and be with Christ, which is better by far, by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And then he sort of has this prophetic um, intuition where he says, and I'm convinced of this, I know that I will remain. So it's almost like, I don't really know how this trial is going to go, but I know, I know that I'm going to remain in the body and I will continue with all of you for your progress and your joy in the faith. So that through my being with you and your boasting in Christ, Jesus will abound on account of me. So Paul's goal, his emphasis is that we would, that his, the church of Philippi would continue to boast in Christ. He's going to go on living. He's going to go on being a benefit to them, encouraging them, preaching the gospel, supporting them, challenging them. And the goal is that they would continue to boast in Christ. If you, maybe you're at this mindset where you're like, man, it would, I've been there. Lord, can, just take me home, right? Like I'm, I'm just done with this life and I just want to be with you. And I, I wonder if, if you actually can say what Paul said that it's better by far. Like, do you, do you really believe that? Are you willing and ready to give up everything, count everything that you've gained as garbage for the sake of Christ? Like, if you were to die, to, are, you, are you willing to give up your job and your house and your car and your relationship with your children and say, you know what? Christ is first. So here's the third time we see. He says, whatever happens. So remember, he's writing to the church. He doesn't know if he's going to live or die. He's going to defend the gospel. He's there to encourage them. But he says, whatever happens, no matter what, church, no matter what you experience, no matter what happens to me, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. This is a beautiful phrase. Worthy of the gospel. We see it two other times. Once in Ephesians chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And then we see it in Colossians chapter 1. He says, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. And please him in every way. Whatever happens, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. I think a life that's worthy of the gospel is a life that lives for Christ. A life worthy of the gospel is a life that shares Christ with your coworkers and your neighbors. It's a life that lives grace-filled, not grump-filled. A life worthy of the gospel is a life that remembers where you came from. Alan read it to us this morning. How, in Psalm 103, how he brought us up. He lifted us up. He remembers where you once were, a sinner. And Jesus, in his loving compassion, willingly gave his life so that you could have forgiveness of your sins. You remember that daily. This idea of living for Christ, I think it is the hardest thing in the Christian life. It actually, in some cases, would be easier to die for Christ because to live for Christ is a daily decision. It's not something, a box that you check off and say, oh, got that done. No, it's a daily, sometimes an hourly decision where you say, Lord, I'm living for you. I'm not here for the world. I'm not here for what the world offers me. I live for Christ, a daily decision. Live your life worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come to you and see you or only hear about you in my absence, Paul says, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. So to live a life worthy of the gospel, church, we got to stand firm in one spirit. We stand, we're, we're drawing a line in the sand right now, today. I live for Christ. I'm standing firm. No matter what we experience, no matter what outside forces come our way, and one day, maybe, if we start experiencing persecution because of our faith, no, we're going to stand firm. We 
we stand on the truth of God's word and we know that God is with us and therefore we stand firm in his spirit. And the second part, we strive together as one. We're unified together as one for the sake of the gospel. This is how we live a life worthy of the gospel. We stand firm and we strive together for the sake of the gospel. Why do bad things happen to good people? Actually, Scripture tells us that there are no good people. Maybe the question we should ask is, why has God chosen us to experience his grace? Why do we not have to experience the punishment, the wrath of God? Because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Why do bad things happen to Christians? I think we see in Philippians a little bit of, of this. But maybe, just maybe, the suffering or the difficulty or the negative thing that you're experiencing right now, maybe it's been granted to you by God. Because we read in verse 29, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Wow. Maybe the Lord has counted you worthy so that you can use those negative things, those difficulties, the death, the loss, the job loss, the children who are far from the Lord, the financial struggles. You can use those things for Christ. How should Christians respond when bad things happen? Here are the three things in summary. Number one, Use what has happened to you to help advance the gospel by living grace-filled lives and sharing the reason for the joy that is in you. Number two, know that what has happened to you will work out for your deliverance. Will work out. You can count on it. You can be sure, you can be confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. It will work out for your deliverance, how? Through the prayers of others and through the provision of the Holy Spirit. And then whatever happens, church, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Because to live is Christ. To die is gain. Pray with me, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, for how you've um, reminded us of where we once were. And Lord, we don't understand why you've extended grace to us, but we say thank you, Lord. And we know that with your provision of grace and the Holy Spirit comes responsibility. And for some of us, you've considered us worthy to suffer for your sake. And I pray, Lord, that we would take the negative things, the bad things, the things that we consider so difficult in this world, that we would take those and we would use them to advance the gospel. We'd live grace-filled lives and share the reason for the joy that lives in us. Lord, however you're speaking, I ask that you would help us to respond. Whatever you're saying to us, Lord, each of us, some of us need to fill in the blank, Lord. We need to change what's in the blank. Right now, if we're honest, we would say we live for ourselves. But maybe today you're calling some of us, Lord, to change that and say, I live for Christ. Everything I have, everything I am belongs to you, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that you, as we take a few moments to hear from you and respond, that you would speak to our hearts. That we would be, would be attentive to your Holy Spirit. And Lord, if we need to come and confess our sin or repent of our selfishness or maybe we need to surrender this thing and be 
instead of being bitter or grumpy about the thing that we're enduring, maybe we, we need to give it to you and help and ask for your help in, in seeing how we can use it, Lord, to further your kingdom. Whatever it is, Lord, that you're saying to us, help us to be attentive to your, your calling. So Bethany Church, I want to ask you to consider this one thing. Ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me and how should I respond? What are you saying to me and how should I respond? Stand with me and let's sing together.